Welcome to the presentation, Find It First Hand, a Writing To presentation by Joel Thomas. This presentation will make use of how to write anything, uh, your textbook for the class, and you can see on this slide which chapter we're going to be using primarily. Um, and I'll be posting some other resources that are available on the uh, supplemental resources page that are uh, right alongside this lesson on the course website. Um, and you can kind of click on those and use those um, as you encounter them and as you need to. This concept may be a review for some students, but let's talk about a primary source versus a secondary source. Now, a lot of times when we hear primary, we think, well, number one, and secondary is number two, but that doesn't really apply when we're talking about research sources. In this case, a, a primary source is a document that provides an eyewitness account of an event or phenomenon. In other words, it's something firsthand. And we'll look at some examples here in just a minute. A secondary source is something, um, a type of source where you're getting the information secondhand. So this would be a report about something where someone is sharing information, not that they saw firsthand, but they researched themselves. So let's look at some examples here. Let's discuss some examples then of primary sources and secondary sources. And you can find more of these in the Ruskowitz book in the uh, pages just shown on the previous slide. Um, let's talk about primary sources then. Uh, those of course are the, the documents themselves, if they're historical documents, or the data from the actual research itself. Maybe it's a creative work. Maybe it's something uh, someone wrote about his or her own life. You can see some examples there um, of what that means. The Constitution, for example, would be a historical document. It's a primary source. But analysis and reporting about the Constitution, um, someone's opinions about the Constitution, those are all secondary sources. Um, correspondence like letters, um, for example, famous letters like Martin Luther King's letter from a Birmingham jail, um, or something as common as someone's email. Um, again, those are going to be primary sources. Um, but if it's reporting about those things or someone writing a paper about uh, the L Martin Luther King letter, that again would be a secondary source. And you can kind of go down the line then and see um, what that means, what's primary and what's secondary. You should use some caution then when you use interviews that you might access on TV, radio, or even publications on the internet. These can provide some really great information, but you need to be careful that if you're required to use a primary source, you may not want to call this a primary source because, again, often what these television programs or radio programs do, they'll take pieces of the interview and they'll take some and use them, they'll take some and take them out. That's a very good thing. It keeps us from having to sit there through sometimes boring, sometimes unnecessary stuff. Sometimes people make mistakes and they need to edit it out. I edit these presentations for you quite a bit. But that also can make it less of a primary source and sometimes even the people being interviewed had things they really wanted to say and, and a whole story they wanted to get across and that'll be cut out of the finished interview. So I wouldn't really refer to those as primary sources. One great way to get some primary source information and find something firsthand is through an interview. And especially as you're working on some papers uh, and projects working with local issues, sometimes the best information um, you can get is talking to somebody who has experience in this regard. Now you got to be careful. We'll get into some uh, reasons and ways to be careful. But um, if you want some basic information about this, you can look at how to write anything, and we have a page number there posted on the slide. Um, a lot of people might be wondering why would I want to do an interview? That seems like a lot of work. Well, one reason is it can give you expertise and insights um, that you can't really get anywhere else. Um, and again, sometimes you're going to get somebody's opinion and they might have very limited experience or um, they, their personality might play a part. And that can be a danger. Um, but otherwise, uh, you can get some really great insights. So for example, if you're doing um, a paper about a criminal justice issue um, in a local area, interviewing somebody who's been on the ground with that and who has that experience, that's a great thing to do. Um, you can also get anecdotal evidence to show some practical insight. That's my line on, on the slide there. What that means is you can have them give you some great stories and some explanations that show kind of how these theories and principles apply 
um, to everyday situations and to situations that this person has actually encountered. That can be really valuable for you, you and your paper. When thinking about interviews, you should be aware of the pros and the cons, some potential positives and potential negatives. I realize that for some assignments, like our research paper, um, you're required to do some primary sources, and I strongly encourage you to do interviews. But in other projects, you may have that option. You may not be sure if you want to do it or not. So here's some things to think about. Potential positives for interviews. You can obtain unique perspectives and expertise. Sometimes you'll know someone who has 25, 30 years of expertise in something, and that will really be unique to your paper, and it'll also add quite a bit. Sometimes you'll be writing about a specific area or a specific location or a specific group, and they may not have a lot of information published about them, but you can get some great information from doing an interview. It allows you to ask specific questions for information that might otherwise be unavailable, and it'll help you establish professional and academic relationships, especially if you're going to stay in the same area where you're going to school and doing these interviews, or maybe you're doing it about in an area where you know you're going to return and have a professional career there. People like to hear from students. People like to help students. And it can help establish yourself as somebody who's interested in becoming an expert in an area so that maybe in a year or two when you go to apply to a job, they'll have heard of you. They'll have known, oh yeah, that, that student interviewed me. I've already met that person before and I trust them. We had a good experience. Some potential negatives is that it does require some time investment. And if you think that you can just show up to an interview and ask a few questions, get some information, slap it into your paper, you're not going about it the right way, and it, and it could be disastrous. At the most, it'll be mediocre, and it won't really matter. It won't really add much. At the, at the worst, it could be really disastrous for you. So you need to weigh the risk versus reward. Again, interviews can really make a paper go from mediocre or average to amazing and excellent. But sometimes it can be a big time waste so you have to ask yourself if it's worth it. You can also think about how it does require coordinating with other people's schedules. We'll talk about email interviews later. That's kind of often if you're doing an interview even over the phone you do have to coordinate with other people's schedules and that can be a little bit of a pain. When I was a student I actually had to ask off time for work and do sort of a sick day because I had a bunch of interviews to do and the only time that it would work was during the day when I was working. For, in that case it was a very good risk and I got some great material and was able to present at a couple of academic conferences with the material that I got. So for me, it was worth it. But you just have to weigh that risk. Also, remember that interviews result in raw information. It's not just automatically going to have some information that you can slap right into your paper without working with it. Sometimes you're really going to have to set it up and explain things for your audience before bringing in the research information that you gain from the interview. So it does take some work to work with it. When planning an interview, you need to choose your interviewee. That means, for the sake of our own presentation and lesson here, that means the person who is being interviewed. You're going to choose that person based on that person's expertise and experience, not just convenience. So in other words, don't just say, well, I think my sister has some good opinions about this and I know her. Or, oh, I think my roommate could probably give me a couple of minutes of insight on this, when really your roommate knows nothing about it. It just happens to be convenient. You also want to make sure that you, after you've chosen the right person and contacted that person, you want to make sure that you do get some good details and arrange those ahead of time. Make sure that if you're interviewing someone, you're able to choose a quiet place with few distractions. Interviewing in the middle of a busy coffee shop can, can result in a really frustrating interview. I've learned that one from experience. I've interviewed people in the back rooms of rock shows where when I went to go actually transcribe, that means type out the interview material, I could barely hear what the person was saying. That's a mistake. You don't want to do that. So find a good quiet place. Find an office. If you're at your university or college, maybe find an open room in the library. Many libraries do have rooms that are available for this purpose. Find somewhere where you're not going to be interrupted. You're still going to get the occasional interruption within a library room or something like that but it won't be quite so bad. Sometimes the interviewee will have an office where you can interview that person too. You have to be careful though if that person's super busy, you're going to have a constantly ringing phone, you're going to have people constantly knocking on the door and interrupting, you don't want that. 
You also want to make sure that you arrange a time frame. So in other words, you're saying, okay, I expect this will last 30 minutes or an hour. Ahead of time, you want to obtain permission to record the interview. Most people have no problem with that. And if you explain to them, listen, I'm a student, I'm going to take notes during this interview, but I want to make sure that I catch everything. Most people are, are fine with that. As you plan your interview, you want to make sure that you're writing good questions. It's a huge mistake to just show up to the interview and hope that you're going to pop some good questions in there and, and just feel like your adrenaline's going to kick in and you're going to do a great job. It requires a lot of planning and you want to write out some questions. Now be prepared that the best material you'll probably get is going to be from the follow-up questions and we'll talk about that a little bit. But you want to write really good questions, maybe put those on a note card so you're not trying to find them on a long notebook, write neatly so you can read them. And you want to ask different types of questions and you want to be aware of what type of response your question might get. For example, open-ended questions versus yes or no questions. An open-ended question is a question where the response can lead to a more thoughtful or at least more detailed response as opposed to just a yes or a no. So we have some examples in our presentation here. If you ask Mr. Mayor, do you think that drugs are a problem in this city? Well, that might get a yes or a no. Yes, I think they are a problem. No, they're not really a problem. Or, well, we're working on it. Whereas if you give an open-ended question that actually suggests a response, you might try something like, Mr. Mayor, what are some ways that drug abuse hurts this city? That way the response will directly go to the response that you really are looking for and you want to plan that. What response are you looking for? Again, you might want to ask something like, do you think that adults with developmental disabilities need services and opportunities to help them? And that's a yes or a no question and, and that one's even worse because you're definitely expecting a yes question. So you're wasting time asking what's called a rhetorical question in, in some places where you know the response, you're just kind of letting it go to an automatic yes, you're not really getting anything that you need. Instead, you might try something like, what kind of services and opportunities could help adults with developmental disabilities? Again, that's going to give you some specifics and some details, and that's what you want. You want to make sure that as you write your questions, you're using good action verbs to help interviewees know how to respond. So, for example, asking them to describe things, or explain, or characterize, or relate one thing to another, relate this problem to another problem. When you're writing your interview questions, you want to research as much as possible before the interview so you can write questions that dig, dig deeper. Don't ask questions that are just for basic information that you could find anywhere. That's boring for one thing. That's wasting your interviewee's time. And that goes against the whole reason of doing an interview. To get an interview, remember, you want to get that unique information, that special expertise and experience to shine through. So asking generic basic questions that you could find the answers on Wikipedia, that's no good. So you want to get those deeper questions and use why questions that can help get the explanation and analysis. If you've picked someone to interview, you value that person's expertise and experience. So you want that person to explain and analyze the situation, not just give you basic information. You also want to anticipate some of the standard answers and prepare follow-up questions to dig deeper. You can kind of get a sense of how your interviewee is going to respond ahead of time. Maybe you've done some research where you've seen previous interviews where they've given the same answers. Maybe you've also talked with that person before or have some knowledge of that field enough to know what that person is probably going to say. And so you plan, they're probably going to say this, here's how I'm going to follow it up. I'm going to ask them to dig deeper. I'm going to ask them why they would say that. Some best practices for while you're actually conducting the interview, whether you're in the room or maybe doing it by the phone, you want to record the interview. You can use a digital recorder. Many smartphones have an application where you can record things. You can use an old tape recorder if you want to go old school with it. You want to take notes even if you're recording. That'll help you with a few different things. Number one, focus a little bit more on the interview itself rather than trying to remember what the next question is going to be. And it'll help remind you of what the main points the interviewee is trying to make so you don't have to go back and ask questions again. You also want to make sure that you take notes during the interview so that it'll relieve some nervousness. That kind of seems really silly. but Sometimes when you don't have much experience with the interview, you do get a little bit nervous and fidgety, and taking notes will help give you something to do that you're not fiddling around with the pen and distracting the person. 
It'll also help you get the essential information. So when you go back to transcribe and get information out of that interview, you'll remember what main points you're looking for. And it will also help you plan some of your follow-up questions. And those follow-up questions are going to be key for you. Your interviewee will sometimes have standard answers in his or her head, things that are sort of common to say in response to questions, especially if you're asking what seems to them pretty basic questions. So asking those why questions are going to be really key. And asking them, can you tell a little bit more? Or, well, why do you think that's important? Things like that. That takes some experience and some practice to get to where you're comfortable doing follow-up questions. But I encourage you to try that. Another best practice is to act like you've been there before. What that means is don't act like it's such a huge, new, nerve-wracking thing that you're completely giving all the power over to the interviewee. Act as if you're a professional, act as if you've done this before, and that this is something that you're capable of doing. Even if you're very nervous, even if you've never done it before, even if you feel like you're probably gonna goof this all up and this is gonna be the worst experience anybody ever had, fake it. You can do a good job and you can get that confidence and show that confidence and that will help your interviewee give more confident digging deep type of answers. Of course even though you want to be confident you don't want to show off. It's annoying when the interviewer acts as if he or she knows everything about the topic that could possibly be known and when the questions really turn out to just be you going on and on and on about whatever your information is that's really annoying and time wasting for the interviewee so don't do that. You can provide some information and say, hey, I found this in my research. What do you think about that? Or that led me to this question. But you don't want to show off with it. The last thing is don't argue with your interviewee. Again, that can get really annoying. That can sever relationships. That can also result in you not getting the information that you want. When people get defensive, they close off. They shut up. And you don't want that. You want people to feel comfortable with you. You want them to be friendly. You don't want to challenge them too much, at least at first. This is not a cable news talk show. You are not your favorite person who can scream in the face of whoever's being interviewed and try to make them repent of their ways or you know, expose some huge lie or inconsistency. That's not your job here. Your job here is to research. Be professional when conducting the interview, especially if you need to bring up an opposing viewpoint. You need to do that in a diplomatic, respectful way. You might be interviewing someone that you don't respect. You might be interviewing someone that you very strongly disagree with. That's going to happen. That's okay. But you want to be professional. You want to be respectful. So you want to phrase your questions in such a way that it's not really you asking the question or seeming to attack or confront someone. So you might use phrases like, some people might say, or some people have concerns that, etc. You also could explain that you're supposed to bring up opposing viewpoints as part of your assignment. You can blame it on your instructor. That's fine. You want to make sure that you're kind and professional in doing the interview. Like I said earlier, this is not your own special talk show where you get to belittle people and make them feel small or attack them. If you go into journalism and decide you want to be an, enter an entertainer instead, and you want to do that, then more power to you. Good luck. You'll probably earn some good money. But right now you're working on research in an academic paper and it's not appropriate to attack people. You also want to honor the time agreement. If you said the interview is going to be half an hour, make sure it's half an hour. You also want to thank the interviewee at the end of the interview and then later on send a thank you note or an email or a text. Again, that's a professional courtesy. And if you're doing your research in a field where you might be doing more research later, you've established a contact, a friend, an ally. You've perhaps even given yourself an opening for a job or an internship later. And so you want to behave professionally and you want those people to remember you in a good way. Email interviews are one option for doing an interview and you can Think about some potential negatives and some potential positives when deciding if that's going to work for you or even if that's the only thing that's going to work for your interviewee. You should at least know what's ahead of you and, and plan around it. Some positives. One is less transcribing or typing recorded responses. And one thing that is kind of a pain about doing interviews is that then you have to go back and listen to the interview and type out what you want to use even type out the whole thing and then go back through and decide what you want to use. That can be time consuming. Email interviews can be very convenient for busy people. Sometimes your interviewee doesn't really have time to go meet up with someone and spend half an hour or an hour 
And sometimes that interviewee will want to do an email interview just to save time or to work on it here and there throughout the day. The interview also is going to have some more time to consider and reflect on answers, and that can lead to more thought and more detail for you as the interviewer. And that can be very helpful because then you're not getting people's automatic or standard responses. They have a chance to actually give you some good details and thought. On the other hand, there are some negatives, or at least some potential negatives, to email interviews. One is that just the written word sometimes lends itself to misunderstandings. Some of us have experienced this with emails and with text, and that can be really difficult with email interviews. Sometimes the whole meaning of what someone is saying can be expressed in the voice or the way that that person is using body language to get a point across. And you might understand that if you are sitting in a room with a person or even on the phone with a person, whereas if you're reading an email, you might completely miss the point or misunderstand. So vocal tones and body language are missing. Sometimes people's attempts at humor or the other emotions they might display, you're going to lose those in an email interview. I've seen sometimes when someone is being a little sarcastic or has some dry humor, on an email interview and a student will take it very literally and put something into a research paper and it's very clear that that's not really what the interviewee had in mind and that can be dangerous. Sometimes your questions can be misinterpreted and some students do struggle with their writing. Some students struggle to be clear. When you're in an interview situation in a room, a person can ask you to repeat yourself or they can tell from your body language or your vocal tone what you're getting at. That doesn't always happen with an email interview. You also could have your ideas misrepresented or the interviewee could be providing some ideas to you and you might misrepresent those ideas because you don't fully understand them but you think you do. Along with that, another potential negative for an email interview is that many people don't express themselves well in writing, including the students who are conducting the interviews. But there are people who would be great interviewees who may have wonderful, insightful things to say. They may have great stories to tell. They may have great descriptions that they would just come up with off the top of their heads. But with an email interview, they don't write very well. They're not confident in their writing, so they're not going to share very much and that happens sometimes. Another thing to keep in mind is just as a positive that an interviewee has more time to think about responses and make them more thoughtful and detailed, well the flip side of that is that the interviewee could have more time to edit and redact information, in other words take information away. Sometimes we say things in responding to questions and later we think, wow, maybe I shouldn't have shared that much or maybe I should have said that in a better way, maybe I should have said that in a more diplomatic way but that would make your paper not as interesting or wouldn't get the real information that you wanted. With an email interview, you're giving people a chance to take back some of the things that they said. Another way to get some good information firsthand is through observations. And this is one where it's a little tricky to do the uh, actual citations and documentations for this. Um, and this is not really one that will apply to most of your papers, but I want to put it out there just in case this does appeal to you and this is something you can do. And this is the idea of having a formal observation. Um, this isn't just you writing about your own experiences. You're, you're welcome to insert that into your papers as it's appropriate. But this is talking about actually setting up an observation and going to watch something, going to check in with something. And uh, this is one that you'll want to set up ahead of time um, and work with people. But if you look at these pages in uh, our textbook, How to Write Anything. They'll give you some good advice. And this is where you would kind of write some questions and things that you were hoping to observe, things you were wanting to look at, and then go look at them in the field. Um, again, you'll want to ask beforehand about what you can record. You'll definitely want to take a notebook and write some things down. Some people would let you record things. Other people would just let you, you know, maybe make some notes on your phone, things like that. But be real courteous about this. And what you're going to look for then is uh, information about what's going on, but you're also going to look for ways to analyze that. So for example, if you're going to uh, do uh, a community issues paper or community needs type of paper, let's say, uh, for example, you're going to go observe a downtown area that might be um, losing a lot of businesses or have a lot of um, shut down businesses and not a lot going on in that downtown, um, then, you know, walking around with a notebook or even dictating uh, 
notes to yourself on a recorder you know you wouldn't really have to set something up with that um, ahead of time with anybody like that because it's you know public property if you're going to a factory to observe something for example uh, maybe you're riding along with um, law enforcement or you know going into an apartment building that's a problem something like that you definitely want to set that up ahead of time um, if you're going to be doing any observations that involve people. Maybe it's not a full-blown research study, but if it is a sensitive population like people with developmental disabilities or children or something like that, you might even have to go through um, like an internal review board with um, that organization or with your uh, university or college. So just be aware of those things. Um, you also want to think about writing your own experience. Um, I don't recommend doing much of that in papers, but sometimes students do have um, relevant experience. If you do that, the section should be brief and focused. No rambling stories, um, no going off on a rant. Um, you need to be direct and to the point. You need to use very clear description and, and good specific details, like with anything else, that support your thesis. And then you also need to show how it specifically and directly supports the point you're trying to make. Again, don't just go off on a rant and hope it takes up a couple pages and, you know, gives you a good bunch of content. It needs to be just like anything else you use in your paper. It needs to have a purpose and you need to include it in a way that it supports your overall thesis. Interviews and surveys can be really great pieces of your research. And my job is to empower you to go out and do those and I know those are brand new things for many of you and remember I'm always happy to help you with those schedule a meeting to stop by and talk with me or meet up somewhere else or just correspond with me online and I'll be glad to help you well we've reached the end of the find it firsthand lesson presentation you can now go on and take the find it firsthand quiz you can also check out some of the other module 3 presentations that maybe you haven't checked out yet and of course these presentations are made for you to use these ideas and use these skills as you develop your research papers.